let's get into it right so um how do you how do you talk about observability without actually talking about observability right um for for a while now i i love to use the the analogy or the metaphor of an airplane so that is like an old Boeing 747 or 737, one of the early models, probably not like the, the earliest, like the first one, but it's it's fairly, fairly old. And we see that, right? There's a lot of knobs and meters and so much information. And the interesting thing is it had to be flown by three people. So you have the pilot, the co-pilot, and then there's a third person. Basically, we can't see the seat right now because the picture is too close, but there's the flight engineer. And the flight engineer's job was nothing but looking at all the different information, trying to make sense out of it and keeping the pilot and co-pilot know if, if something was off, if something went wrong, if we lost like, I don't know, cabin pressure or anything like that, right? So we can imagine just looking at the sheer information or number of information, how complicated that job must have been. So, why am I telling about that? Well, because it's kind of the same thing with observability, right? We're adding more and more stuff and we're coming back to that in a, in a second, but we're adding more and more stuff and we're trying to make sense out of something which is out of the scope of a human mind to process. So what, why am I telling that? Well, there is like a little bit of a gap between what we love to think of systems and what it really is. What we love to think of is same as flying, I'm not a pilot. So for me, flying sounds, well, simple. I know there's a couple of physical laws and stuff, but as long as we keep the physics in check, flying can't be that hard, right? And when we talk about systems, it's kind of the same thing. So we have like a, a, an API gateway, we have three endpoints, and obviously there's one service to, to, um, to respond to all those endpoints. In the best case, it will be a single one, but we're we're looking at um, separation of concerns, so we have three ones. But we know that's not true, right? That's not reality. The reality looks more like that, right? So you, you have services that actually respond to those endpoints, but they have to do more stuff. They may intercross sometimes, they go down to databases, they call other services. There, there's basically an unlimited number of possibilities what could actually happen. But the, but the good thing is that as users, we don't have to think about that. And I think it's, it's our job on the other side, implementing all of that to hide this complexity and give people the feeling that stuff is simple. And, 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 and that nothing can really go wrong. And we all know it's not true. So who am I to talk about that? And Jennifer so nicely introduced me. I'm Chris. Um, the last name is a little bit more German in the original pronunciation, but we're, we're keeping that away because it doesn't work anywhere except for Germany and maybe some other of the Germanic language uh, countries like Sweden. Um, I'm a senior developer advocate in Stana. Um, doing software engineers for I don't know how many years. I just stopped counting after 10 because at some point you just start to feel old. Uh, programming language wise, uh, if you can name it, I probably did it at some point in time. I may not be like perfectly fluent, but part of my job is to at least grasp like the full blown picture of, of different programming languages, of different programming environments, Windows, Linux, um, Mac OS, what, whatever is there. And as I said, I'm from Germany. So there's one very important fact. Actually, there's two very important facts about me. But the first one is I love beer, like all good Germans. So if we talk about technical facts, that's certainly the most technical one. And the other one is I love old technology. So there's a lot of consoles and, and old computers behind me, just in case you're wondering what that is. Right, so getting back to the actual topic. Um, when we talk about observability, let's back off a little bit, like a couple of years, maybe a decade or two. So where we started was capturing metrics. Metrics was all we had. We looked at CPU metrics, we looked at memory metrics, we looked at throughput, all those kinds of numbers. 
but I'm coming from, or as you could see, or as you just saw, I'm coming from a very strong engineering background. Um, I'm not a, an operations person. So for me, when I had an issue, well, it was not really helpful, right? I mean, yeah, okay, CPU uh, is under full load, maybe expected, maybe unexpected. It may hint that something is wrong, but does it try to help me solve the actual issue? No, most of the time it doesn't at least, right? And it doesn't become easier when we, when we look into virtualization and stuff. So from, from the engineering side, we had one more thing which we were all proud about, or maybe not, and that was log files. I've written so many different log messages in my life, and I'm not proud of like 90% of those. Um, we, we actually created log messages up to the point where operations people came to us and like, hey, uh, can you reduce the number of logs because you're basically hawking all the disk space now? Um, and we were like, yeah, sure, we can, we can do that. But if something goes wrong, what, what we do? We, we don't know what, what would happen. We don't know what the, what the actual process flow was. We don't know where it failed. So we had to keep those log files around. So we had those like two basic um, things, mem um, uh, metrics on one side and, and infrastructure metrics mostly, like host metrics and block files on the other side, mostly coming from engineering or from other technology we use like databases and stuff. So when we now look into a little bit more of the observability side, we see those things coming back. So we still have CTU and performance metrics. Performance metrics are part of the application. So they may actually help you to figure out like what parts of the application may be slow or not. Uh, we still have RAM usage. Uh, we still have log files. And to be honest, we're probably adding more and more logs still. And I'm still not sure I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, and then we had alerts. We had alerts, we have alerts. And, and that is important, right? If, if we know that something is a bad state, there doesn't need to be any machine learning, any kind of, of AI to tell us, hey, that is, by the way, that is, that is wrong, I think, because we know it's wrong, so we can create alerts straight away. But when we look at observability, we're just adding more stuff. Uh, now we have information about the cloud providers, the cloud providers' performance, um, communication between different cloud services. We have end user monitoring, which means uh, monitoring inside of our web application or our mobile application. We add dependencies because we're now in a, in a very dynamic microservice driven way. So we're having a lot of dependencies between different services. We add profile information with always on profilers. We have SLOs, SLAs. Well, SLAs are a little bit different. They, they've been a thing a decade ago, uh, but SLOs are kind of newish. Um, we have health metrics. Um, and, and one thing that I think is like super nice from an engineering side, we also have diff distributed traces. And distributed traces are one of the major benefits for, for me, which made the transition between like pure monitoring and um, the APM observability side. And I would say we, we had like APM somewhere in the middle. Uh, a lot of people a um, couple of years ago started using APM tools and they gave us quite a few of those things, but APM systems were mostly built for like for the old generation of software, software monoliths. They are not specifically built from ground up to support like highly dynamic, highly distributed systems. So now we have plenty, and I mean plenty of more information. But what we what 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 doesn't really help us is when you think back to this airplane. Now we have a lot of information that we need to grasp and to, to correlate in our mind. So what we really need, and that is where the observability actually comes in, it gives us context. It tries to do all of that, all the hard work for us. So what does that mean? Well, from, for me, um, it, it all comes along with the DevOps, the Agile, whatever you're going to call it, this movement, this like faster iterations, um, more dynamic iterations, finding out what actually helps. And it's, it's, a, it's a 
thing that needs to go through all of the different stages of, 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 of the company, right? Uh, it needs to, from, at least from my perspective, it needs to start all, all, the, all of the top for management. And management means that management is on board because from my perspective, if management is not on board with any kind of agile-ish um, strategy, you're on a lost cause here, right? Um, you're never going to do that because it, it, it means that you actually have to put energy, put money into the system. The cool thing is that with all of those things, we can do it all the way, right? We can start in engineering. We can, we can deploy the system in a staging environment, in, in user acceptance testing, UAT, what, whatever. And we can probably already figure out that something is wrong before actually going into production. But we can also do the other cool thing. We can go into production and say, okay, we're doing red green deployments. We're doing like canary deployments, whatever we want. We are the ones to decide now because we have enough insight and enough information to do educated guesses and educated decisions. So coming back to the analogy of the airplane, right? Uh, analogy is only good if we have like two sides to it. Um, that's a current model, a fairly current model, at least, um, of a, a, a 737. And what we see is, well, except for that the picture was taken closer in the front of the cockpit, there is no third seat anymore. The flight engineer is not a position which still exists. It's only pilot and co-pilot these days. And the interesting thing is that a lot of the the old information that the flight engineer had to understand is now part of the flight computer, right? Um, so what we see is like we have six screens. We have two on the left, which are for the pilot. There's two on the right, which are for the co-pilot. And as far as I know, they show the same information, all the standard stuff. And then we have like the top middle screen, which is flight altitude, um, uh, uh, fuel level, stuff like that. I, at least I think, as I said, I'm not a pilot. Unfortunately, I love to be. And then there is like this middle bottom screen, this like pinkish screen. It. Um, and that one only changes color if something is really bad. Basically, it hits the fan, if you, if you want to say it in a more French way. Right? So the, the good thing is this color is like so special that you can always keep like a half eye on it and see, oh, the color is still there. If it turns black or some other thing, um, you certainly want to put your attention on that screen and figure out what is going on. So the board computer is basically our observability tool. So um, I already talked a little bit about that, like classic or classic observability. Basically what I, what I said is from my perspective, like the basic APM where we came from, it's metrics, it's log files. And APMs gave us the first time some kind of like a distributed trace, basically, a, or at least like a trace, not yet distributed, but a trace, which meant we could understand like how the request actually flow, flow through, the, through the whole system and through all the parts of the application. Uh, with observability and the more microservice dynamic um, environments, especially uh, with things like Kubernetes and stuff, uh, we need to go the more distributed tracing route. But this, the idea is still the same. Uh, we're capturing trace information or span information at every single point in the, in the process. And we see that in a bit. So what do we need now um, for like the real awesome observability uh, something that at Instana we often call like enterprise observability. We need more pillars. And more pillars is always good. Uh, even the Greeks knew people knew that. So from, from the enterprise observability, the Instana picture, we still have like metrics, distributed traces, and log files. But what we add on top of that is automation. And we really believe in automation in the sense of if you have a decently complicated system, something which where, where services come and go, right? A highly dynamic environment. And, and you probably also add like serverless functions, um, stuff that only exists for a couple of seconds. There is just no way to configure or set up anything manual 
you need automation to, to do that. And, and as I said, we are strong believers in automation. Um, so we try to automate as much as possible. The other thing that I already mentioned is we need context. And context means that the, not only we correlate all the information, um, but based on the, on the automation we have, that we actually understand how services work together, what their dependencies are, and how those dependencies influence each other, especially in cases of, of, of problems, of failure situations. And then we have the intelligence, which is basically the machine learning, the, the AI, whatever you're going to call it, whatever you want to call it. It's the intelligence to, to understand when there are problems, when there are outliers, when there are like situations which are just not normal. So why is that important? Well, I kind of hinted to that. The architectural complexity just keeps increasing. And architectural complexity can come from a couple of things. One thing is microservices. Um, but microservices are not the only thing. Obviously, microservices add a lot, a, a lot more like uh, network uh, communication, a lot more network hoops, all those kinds of information um, that can go wrong. But they can also make it a little bit easier in terms of reasoning uh, because these services in itself are much smaller, right? It's, it's the trade-off between like adding more areas where errors can occur versus a little bit of a better maintainability. The other thing is technologies. Um, I, you remember I'm coming from a strong engineering background and I always hated to be forced to use a specific technology just because it was already deployed, it was already around. I hated it. Uh, there was never the right database I wanted. There was never the right uh, runtime environment that makes sense. And, and that changed. Um, I would say about five to six years ago was like the big change uh, where we went from like virtualization or VMs to like containers and where it became much easier to have more technologies deployed and, and understood. And as an engineer, I really love that. Now I can have like many different databases. I can choose the best tool for the job, which is from my perspective, really important. And especially for like things like scalability and things, we certainly have to do that. And the last thing is environments. Environments, I mean, well, with environments, I mean, Kubernetes, I mean, OpenShift, um, Cloud Foundry, IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud, whatever is there, we still have virtual machines, we still have dedicated hardware for certain tasks. But the cool thing is, and, and this kind of started with the whole Docker movement, it, we, we, as engineers, as, as QA, or what, whatever is in the process, we are getting closer to the actual system we're running in. It's much easier to develop on a system which is closer to what it will be in the end. Um, obviously, Kubernetes takes away a lot of the underlying hardware information, a lot of the underlying operating system. And that is good and bad. It's bad when something happens. It's good for, for engineers to just run like Minikube on their own machine and trying to figure out how to actually work in this system. Um, but, and here's the problem, right? I said architectural complexity increases and it often prevents us from quick reasoning. Quick re reasoning in the sense of something goes wrong and we need to figure out what is wrong. Um, in a simple system, it doesn't need to be like super complicated. That is a simple dependency graph that Instana actually shows about, or that Instana understands about the system. Uh, there's a lot of different things in there that may be hosts, there may be uh, virtual cloud provider or cloud hosts, uh, virtual machines, um, Kubernetes cluster information, services, endpoints, whatever. Right? And Instana figured all that out and figured out how those things depend on each other and, and built a dependency cloud, if you want to say that. So as, as, as humans, we're back to this like old 737 model. We look at that and we have basically no idea what that means. 
it's not, it gives us the chance to do it a little bit easier and to say, hey, by the way, um, please only show me services that are interesting in a certain context. And Instana can do that because it understands all those dependencies. It understands the context you're asking for. Um, and that is what it can look like. But still, quick reasoning is different, right? I mean, we, we, have, we have basically one job, right? And it's not creating random numbers. We all know that doesn't really work, especially not that way. What we do is we create business value. It doesn't matter if it's engineers, if it's QA, if it's operations, if it's DevOps, DevSecOps, it just doesn't matter. We all create business value because without business value, we wouldn't have a job. And business value kind of changed over the last couple of years. From my perspective, right now, the, the typical business value is deployment frequency, or one, one part of that is deployment frequency, which means we people expect that companies are much faster, that we iterate much faster, that we deliver features much faster. And, and people are getting bored real quick, right? We see that with television, that current television has all this like really TV shows because the actual attention span keeps decreasing. And the same goes for features. Deployment frequency though, means that we also need to think about the lead time to change. Like, from the inception of the idea to the actual deployment of the feature, how fast can we go? Can we split this up into multi multiple iterations uh, to be faster, to give people faster new stuff to think and to, to play with? Um, then we have time to restore if something fails. People always expect systems to work these days. They are getting really fed up with systems that are keep constantly failing or that have like, like long maintenance. I mean, imagine your, your bank would say, oh, by the way, um, I'm sorry, like all ATMs and the online platform doesn't work for a day because we have like a, an all day maintenance. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that. Uh, maybe I'm different, but I would at least not. And with the um, higher de deployment frequency, there's one other thing that we really need to, to think about from my perspective, and that is the change failure rate. I mean, it's awesome. It's probably cool if we do like two deployments a day and we're like super fast and we're cool. But if the change failure rate is like 50%, that means every second deployment fails and we'll probably just have to do the second deployment because the first one always fails, right? Um, so in this case, a little bit more testing and maybe only one deployment a day or maybe only one all every like second day, maybe that's better. So a faster deployment frequency does not specifically mean or always mean that it's better. It's only better if the change failure re rate keeps as slow to zero as possible. So oh, 25 minutes in, and I still didn't really say anything, right? <laughs> So looking back at, back at what Instana thinks of observability or what we call enterprise observability, like putting the enterprise back into what is necessary. And I already said all those things. So we are looking a little bit into what that actually means. Um, as I said, we are strong believers in automation. And for, out, for us, automation means automatic discovery. So you install the Instana agent into a system um, for example, into Kubernetes uh, as the operator, as a Helm chart, whatever your personal preference is. And the Instana agent figures out, oh, there is a new container. So it walks into the container and figures out, oh, you're actually running a Java process. So it attaches itself to the Java process, figures out, oh, you're actually running Spring Boot. Cool. Spring Boot, Hibernate, JDBC for Oracle. And Instana figures out all of that by itself and keeps the information in the context of, oh, so that is the container. So that is the technology stack in the container. Oh, by the way, that is the, the Kubernetes node this container is running on. As I said, Instana does all of that by itself. Then we have distributed tracing. I already said it attaches itself to the process at runtime. Obviously, it doesn't work for all programming languages, C++, Go, 
don't really do that, but for basically anything with a virtual machine like Java.net, JavaScript, whatever, uh, we can do that. And what we do is we add sensical sensors into the actual application at runtime, meaning we, we understand like this is your technology and we understand, okay, in Spring Boot, that is what a web handler looks like. That is what a JDBC lo uh, call looks like. And we add hooks into the system at specifically those points to capture metrics, to capture trace information, to capture span information, to capture lock information, all without you doing anything. And the last thing is metric collection, um, obviously because the, the Instana agent is running on the host itself or in a, in a, a, root, in a, in a privileged container on the host. Uh, we capture all the host information. We capture cluster information from Kubernetes. We ca capture information about the virtual machine, about the environment, whatever you can think of, like all the metrics you had before. But the beautiful thing is you don't really have to, to configure it. Um, and the last thing is profiling uh, for, for a lot of programming languages, certain pro programming languages. We also add profiling information. We capture profiles with an always on profiler at an extremely low overhead level, uh, which is great um, if you have like a real problem, um, running a profile on your local machine is never gonna give you like the real picture, never gonna give you what is actually happening in the system. And one thing which is not here, uh, we also create dashboards based on best practices, based on the technology stack we understand you're running. Um, you don't have to do that. You can still create like your own dashboards, but you don't really have to. So context was the second thing. And context is really important. I already hinted to that, right? Uh, if you have multiple services that are responsible in the process of, process of answering a single request, you need to understand how those services work together. So in, in the sense of a distributed trace or a trace in general, sorry, uh, you have multiple chunks like spans, which are like the actual operation inside of a specific service. And you have in the distributed trace, the calls between those spans that connect them, like microservice A calls to microservice B. In between is a call, but those things are spans. The whole thing is a distributed trace. So looking at this picture, we see there's the user and it, he wants to access his account information. Um, to do that, we go to the user data service, uh, which goes in, down to our database, uh, gets the basic information, uh, returns it to the user service, and the user service sees, oh, by the way, in this account information, um, there is an external ID for the CRM system. So we go down to the CRM system, which is now like a completely different system, not built by us. Um, and we can probably not see like what is specifically going on in that thing, but we understand, okay, there is a call to it and we get some information back. Uh, probably like lifetime value of the customer, whatever, right? So that, that is already good because it gives us some kind of a flow chart-ish idea. Uh, but what we are missing is like the, the time-wise information, right? Like in what order does it happen? We can say, or we can imply that the order was top to bottom, but that was just us implying it, right? So now when we look at it from a more like time-wise diagram, we can see it's the same flow. Uh, we have our user service. We go down to the user data service. We have the database. We're going back up the stack. We're coming down again to the, um, to the external CRM service, and then we're done left to right, just uh, the way we read software or read text. Still, um, that may help, but it's not like super perfect. So we need a little bit more information. And what could a real distributed trace look like in, 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 in a system? So that is, for example, just like a basic trace, doing a little bit of a couple of different things, and we see that we have a stack of information and we see that can get fairly complex fairly fast, right? Um, but what is interesting is that we see something which is odd. We see there's a lot of time between point this like 
point A and point B before we go into the gRPC call. So if we say, okay, this 900 milliseconds is certainly too long to answer. Um, it gives us information. Maybe that is what we want to look at, right? Maybe we can figure out what, what is happening in that time. For example, using the profiles we have and figure out, hey, can we, can we slice that down? If we get this down, like, what is it? 400, 450 milliseconds to like half the time maybe 300, 325. Hey, we already made like a big deal. So um, what does that mean? Well, as I said, it can get fairly complicated fairly quickly. And what I like, in at least in Instana, we have two different ways of showing those traces. One's based on like, what is the communication type? What is what is the type of the, the actual span? Like, is it a database call? Is it an HTTP call, is it a gRPC call? What, what is it, which is the technology? And then there is one other thing which I really like, which is show it by endpoint, show it, show it by service. So I can see that there is a lot of calls to the same service, which is like this red, I don't know what the color is like, or what the color is called, this red, pink one, dark pink, um, we see there is a lot of calls to that. In this case, that's the caching service. So obviously that gets a lot of calls to, to mitigate database transactions. Um, but it gives us a lot of information. So if we see that a long call is happening in the same technology, or, or, sorry, in, in the same endpoint or in the same service, that is what we want to look at. And, and all of those information are just coming from this like intelligence cloud, right? Uh, more from this from this dependency cloud. And that is where the intelligence comes in. Um, it's basically um, a graph database. Uh, it's a self-built technology, but it's a graph database if you if you want to see it from a simple term. And that means we have like nodes and we have like the the uh, edges between it that give us information. Like, okay, here is a Kubernetes node, here is a service. And or here's a container, and this container runs on the Kubernetes node, stuff like that. And we traverse this data graph to understand what is going on. And we understand this data graph, or we use this data graph to understand that something is different, that something keeps changing. Um, that means that based on that, plus all the metrics, we understand what is your baseline. And if something goes wrong, and Instana has two ways of doing that. Uh, the first one is the typical stuff. Uh, you have issues. And issues are like, well, nice. Uh, they are what you basically get when you set up your own alert, right? You say, hey, um, we have a drop in, a complete drop in number of requests. Fairly simple one. Um, it's, it's all the way down to zero. So obviously, that's an, that's an issue. It's, it's a typical alert you would get from a system. So now imagine you're in a distributed system and you don't get calls anymore on, I don't know, like 20 different services because, because one upstream service actually failed. So now you have like 20 plus this one service that actually failed and you get 21 issues or 21 alerts. That's not really meaningful at least not from my perspective. So what we do at Instana, because we have the understanding and we have the, the, the graph, we understand those failures or those issues, they are all depending on each other. They're connected, they're related. So what we do is we have issues and then what we create is incidents. And with incidents, we can go ahead and say, hey, this is your problem, complete number or complete drop in number of requests and this is everything, all the different issues, all the independent issues that are related to that. And they are kind of hierarchical in terms of, of time. Um, so for example, if you, if in this case, I think the MySQL went offline because the process crashed, which means the container for the MySQL went down or went away. Uh, so we captured this like uh, infrastructure change event. Uh, we understand that the uh, process died because it was a non-zero um, exit code and a lot of information. And then we understand, okay, based on that problem, 
uh, all those services now have an issue because they try to connect or they try to read data from the MySQL database, uh, which is a fairly nice way of, of just looking at it. And you see normally like extremely fast, like, okay, that seems to be a root cause, right? So when we look at that, um, yep, that's the abnormal termination from the MySQL. So it was correct. I wasn't hundred percent sure if that was the example I chose, but yeah, that, that's it. So why is, why is that important? Um, and I love to do like a little bit of a story um, and I have to go a little bit quicker because we're running out of time a little bit. Um, so imagine it's 3 a.m. You, you, you lie in your bed, you're sleeping, you love your sleep like every good human does, um, at least I do, and something goes wrong. You're on call, so your phone keeps ringing and it's your manager, uh, let's call him, I don't know, Tom uh, and, and Tom, tells you, well, here is a problem. Um, uh, even though we're like in the middle of the night in the States, uh, our European system has an issue right now. Um, we, we, we lose traffic, we lose um, conversions. Uh, we're actually losing money. So we need to fix it fast. Most of the time, unfortunately, the person on call is not the one that actually wrote this specific service that failed. Especially the, the higher number of services, the less common it is to hit the person that actually wrote the service. And you remember that architectural complexity does not help us with quick reasoning. And now imagine it's 3 a.m., you're half sleeping still, you didn't have coffee because it needs to be fast. So you're trying to figure out what the is wrong. So you look at that. And, and, and thankfully, we have those information now in place, right? So let's play it first in the sense of we don't have this information. So you see, okay, service A is failing. Service A would be that one. All right, so, well, it's not your service. It's probably not your programming language. So you look at that and you try to figure out what is going on and what is wrong. You look at log files, you look at metrics, maybe something doesn't show up anymore, which showed up before. So you make some guesses and you come up with the idea of like, oh, it seems like the second call is actually failing. So we see some lock messages of the first one, but the second one went away. So, all right. Um, now we're in a programming language you really have no idea about. Uh, for me, that would be Haskell. Give me Haskell code and I'm lost. Give me Lisp and I'm, well, more than lost, whatever that word would be. So I probably have to call somebody else now. Um, so I call JD. Hey, JD, um, I'm sorry. It's I know it's 4 a.m. for you. Uh, can you can you help me out? We have this issue, and I don't know how to how to solve it. And it's something in your in, in the service of your team. Um, we need to figure that out. Uh, we're losing money. So she looks at the code, and well, it's her source code. It's her team building the service. So she's a little bit faster. She's like half an hour in and she's like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, that service fails, right? So um, either we can now fix it together or we need to get a third person involved, hopefully not, but we're already an hour and a half in, it's, it's 4.30, maybe at 5 a.m. we actually fixed it. Or no, wait, at 5 a.m. we know what it is, right? Now we need to fix it. Is, is that a good way of doing it? No, obviously it's not, right? So what we, what we want is we want to get to this point directly. So if we have a failing call and we have distributed traces, we look at the trace and we look at it and like, oh, here, here is the problem. And the error just bubbled up the stack all the way to the user, which in itself is like a horrible thing, right? The user should never be the receiver of your error. Please, please don't do that capture it somewhere in between and, and try to give the user a meaningful thing, like, please try again. Not right now in 10 minutes, because the problem is if, if you tell people to retry, they're gonna do it constantly and they do it now. Tell people, try it in like 10, 20, 20 minutes, maybe in an hour. Uh, we're working on that, we're, we already fix, uh, we're already working on fixing the issue, please come, about, come back later or come again later. Um, don't hit your service with way more traffic than it should normally have. Anyway, so 
uh, that to, to this. And what I think is important about that is the MTT GBTB, which is the mean time to get back to bed, right? Um, <laughs> it's, it's 3 a.m. and I love to be this mean time to get back to bed to be as close as, to zero as possible. And if I can open a tool and it gives me all the information I need, it's beautiful because we're fast, we can look at that, and we're going uh, gonna get the, the mean, time to, uh, mean time to get back to bed like close to zero because I can either fix it straight away, I can offload it to somebody else who's better and knowledgeable than me, or whatever you wanna do with that. So doing that, we're coming back to this analogy from the beginning. Whatever you do, whatever system you use, obviously I'm biased. I would always recommend using Instana, not because I'm working for Instana, but because I think it's an awesome tool and I used it before. And I, whenever I leave Instana, I'm gonna use it afterwards. It's just an incredible tool to do, but whatever you do, whatever tool you use, don't be on the left side. Don't do it yourself. Don't try to be this flight engineer who has a really tough time, a really hard time to understand what is going on that probably takes too long to figure out that something is wrong. Then it takes a lot of time to figure out what is wrong. And in the worst case, it takes a long time to fix it. So what we want to do is we want to have the flight computer, the board computer to already tell us what is going on. We want the observability tool to tell us, hey, this seems to be the issue. This seems to be the problem. And you want to have this information as fast as possible. As I said, people don't understand anymore that systems have issues and that we can't fix them straight away. And with that, I think we're going to the questions. So, um, how correlate and show telemetry when monitoring microservices based on event-driven pattern where there's async and streaming messages? Do you have a sample? That is a brilliant question. Um, and I don't think we have a real example in our demo system, but surprise, surprise, <laughs> I have a different system which actually does um, a microservice uh, event-driven architecture is based on Kafka, based on a couple of things. And it's an IoT platform um, using the things network, the things stack as an upstream provider, just in case uh, you're, you're looking into that, that's a Larvan provider. So the way it works is that you have um, like follow up spans. So you, you basically drop a message on the message bus uh, with all the information necessary for your span and your trace. Like you, you always have like two IDs, like the trace ID, which is like this overall thing. And then you have like the parent span, like what is, what is, who's the one that is actually forking me off? And then you drop it on Kafka and you see that we, at some point we consume it and then we do a couple of different things. And eventually we drop it back onto, what is it? Uh, somewhere we drop it back onto a different message queue uh, over here. Um, and then you see like, there's a lot of other stuff happening. So what it basically does is it gives you like the whole picture from, from end to end of your, your um, microservice event-driven architecture um, and, and gives you information on how those things depend on each other. And Instana still understands that, right? So Instana understands that you're actually dropping something onto a message queue and the message queue is consumed somewhere else. I hope that answers the question. And I think we're almost out of time. Any other question? I don't think so. But one important thing, if you want to try out Instana, and you see that I have it on the screen right now, if you want to try out Instana, go to instana.com slash trial. Um, follow us on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, whatever you prefer. Um, I can really recommend testing it out, uh, dropping into your, your staging, your uh, a, a UAT environment for, for testing and give Instana the chance to just magically come up with your infrastructure and be blown away by what is possible just by this automation part 
and this understand that Instana brings in the context that Instana brings to, to your system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Chris for his time today. And thank you to the, all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a great day.